Uh, this is actually my 52nd year of keeping bees. I uh, did a book report when I was in third grade or so, and, and uh, was walking home from school shortly thereafter, and there was this huge swarm of bees hanging in a tree, and so I did whatever 10 or 12 year old kids would do, and I went out and kind of saw it in my friend's dad's garage and walked home with this swarm and said, Mom, I want to be a beekeeper. <laughs> She's 93 and she still tells that story. So. <laughs> Is that your first bee beard? I know you can just your bee beards too. Yeah, I've done hundreds of bee beards, so if you ever want to do a bee beard, I'm very good at it. And uh, most people don't get stung. But um, <laughs> they listen to what I say. I've always wanted to have the dean put on a bee beard so I could say, jump when I say jump. <laughs> so, so. But, so this is rather a hoity uh, title, but it really comes down to what my interest is. And, you know, my uh, research had been up to joining an extension was in human dimensions of environmental sciences. And knowing my bee experience, I, I really look at a lot of what's going on in the bee world with, from the perspective that, uh, you know, what are we doing to bees and what impact is that having on them? And exactly what I mean by uh, human dimensions of things is that so often in the environment, we kind of try to take man out of the environment, and yet they play a very integral part of it. And I, it's one variable that we too often eliminate and try and try and understand what's going on in the environment and don't factor in the fact that man is there mucking with things um, for better or for worse. So, and, and then economics is a real uh, perspective of what drives, and I'll get into that quite extensively in terms of what's going on, and that politics is real. You know, it is a real dynamic, in, including in agricultural settings. Uh, uh, it, it makes a lot of decisions for better or for worse. And so human dimensions, uh, folks try and bridge that gap between what's going on in the environment and what's happening with various constraints that uh, humans inter uh, intermix into the, the whole equation. So I need to, to just, I'm, and I'm going to give you a lot of background information. I'm not even going to call, talk about uh, colony collapse until I'm almost halfway through. Because I, I think in order to understand the dynamics, you have to understand beekeeping, you have to understand the bee industry, and I've literally worked in all aspects of it. But it's important that you know that they're called European honeybees for a reason. They are not indigenous to the United States. They were brought over here. Uh, uh, Jamestown, I think, was the first one in the 1600s when the first colonies were, were brought over uh, from uh, Europe. The uh, Avis, uh, the type we typically have, and I'll show you some pictures of this later, is Carnica uh, ligustica, which is the Italian bee, and uh, the Caucasian bee, which is uh, uh, near the Black Sea area. There's also some smattering of mellifera, 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 apis mellifera, mellifera, nasty bee, uh, that is on the Redwood Coast uh, quite uh, extensively. So the relationship with, yeah. Those are all subspecies. Those are all right? subspecies of, of apis mellifera. Yeah. <laughs> um, relationship with bees and man goes back a really long time. Uh, you know, for the bee hunters, this is a, a cave drawing, I, I believe, in southern France that, that depicts a honey robber. And that's man's relationship with bees for a long time, of uh, finding a feral colonies and uh, removing either the honey or the brood protein source. Um, uh, if you ever haven't tried bee larva quiche, it's really succulent. But uh, you know, that, that relationship, they simply go out and find a colony and, and remove it. And that went on for a, a long period of time. Around 1500, we started to become a little more sophisticated in providing logs or skep hives, you know, the, the straw hives that bees would uh, frequent, and we'd be able to, you know, much easier to find them than trying to go out and find the bee tree in the wild. It wasn't until we got to around 18. 50, that Reverend Langstroth uh, took credit for, whether he's the one actually uh, founded or not, uh, of discovering B space. And B space is, depending on the, which book you're reading, it's around three eighths to a half inch of space between a comb that the bees won't build burr comb in, or they won't 
try and fill that space. And that was a huge discovery. If you look at some natural colonies, they kind of weave like this, but there's a natural space in between them. And by understanding what bee space was, we were able to have the removable frame hive. So the, 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 the plane frames that you see and the beekeepers handling, that allowed for us to get in and actually look at and inspect the colony, which made a huge difference in our understanding of diseases, of the reproduction of the entire biology of bees, of being able to really understand what's going on there. Whether he actually discovered it, it's not, not important. But his, the colony that he designed is, um, you know, it's here, you know, and he, he gets credit for it, so it must be true. Uh, the, the, the next uh, uh, individual who uh, is of note is uh, Moses Quinby. Now, Moses Quinby would just make up things about bees that were very, very anthropomorphic and, and you know, describe things as the king bee. And, and it's, it, his book is rather interesting uh, to the reading if you ever get a chance to, to find a copy of it. But he's pretty much credited as being the first commercial beekeeper in the United States, primarily in honey production. Well, since Moses Quimby's time, beekeeping industry has changed dramatically. It is big business. Billions of dollars, millions of bees traveling across the country uh, uh, supplying uh, pollination services. There's also honey and honey production, and then there is uh, packaged bees and queen production. And I'll touch on each one of those uh, individually as I go through. By far, by far. The most important aspect the honeybee industry provides, and when I was a commercial beekeeper, 75% of my cash flow, even though I was officially a queen producer and a bee breeder, 75% uh, of my cash flow came from uh, pollination services. And that pretty much holds true right now. And I got this uh, um, graph from the USDA, so it must be true, um, that the, uh, you know, but it does show uh, the dependency on almonds, apples for pollination services. So we have a lot of apples around this area, mm -hmm. and we're always thinning apples, you know, with various chemical sprays. So what's the deal with needing bees? Does anybody know the answer to that? Why do we need bees if we're trying to thin them? Yeah, you have to have seed set, but what's the really important factor? Ten seeds. Nice, uniform shape seeds. So you want all of the uh, seeds to, uh, for fertilization to occur and set a full uh, complement of seeds within the apple so you have a nice uniform shaped apple. So a lot of times bees will be in um, apples and, and cherries for relatively short periods of time, sometimes only overnight, you know, one day and now. Uh, so, uh, but they are very dependent on, on bees. And the overall value of in the United States is up and down, but about $16 billion that bees are responsible for. You often hear the, the term, well, honeybees are responsible for one-third of the food we eat. And, uh, and then the misquote from uh, Einstein that without be uh, when bees go extinct, man will die in four years. He never said that. But um, <laughs> yes. anyway, what the figure I like of the 120 some odd food groups, 80 of them, bees play a role. So we weren't, we're not going to starve to death. We'll have wheat, gluten free, of course, wheat and um, various other aspects of you know, that wind pollinated crops. But we are not going to have vegetables and fruits and milk, and meat, you know, because of alfalfa pollination and hay requirements. But honeybees are important. And worldwide, this is close to $200 billion that bees provide. Honey is just honey, you know, it's a little bit extra cash flow. Many beekeepers now don't have any extracting equipment at all. They're solely in it for pollination services. But there are many beekeepers who do yield, uh, get a, a good boost to their cash flow from, from honey production. In spring of each year, actually it starts in September of each year, bees are transported all from throughout this country. Every corner, every state comes to California for the almond pollination. It is huge business. 
uh, the, the total number of, is probably even more than the 50% I list here. It's around 2 million, uh, 1.6 to 2 million bees are required for almond pollination. And the last estimate I saw was around 2.4 million bees, total colonies in the United States. And by far, whether you're a beekeeper in, in uh, Helensburg or in Highland County, this industry, the almond industry, influences you because of its influence on the honeybee industry. It's big business there. Uh, if you've ever been to California in the springtime, in February and early March, it is miles and miles and miles of almonds. Uh, 800,000 acres total. That's going to be going down a bit with the drought. Um, western uh, side of the Central Valley is probably not going to have almond production. In the northern part of, of uh, California, where the wind blows uh, fairly substantially, because almonds have a fairly shallow root system and they'll fall over in the winds, are replacing those with walnuts. But it still remains big. There's lots of areas where almonds are going in. 85% of the world's production comes from California. So this is you know, the 2010 price, 2013 price. Uh, actually, 14 price was closer to $200. Almond pollination. When I was commercially keeping bees back in the uh, 80s, um, uh, we were getting $25 to $30 a colony. For, uh, and that's for a three week rental, $200. Then, once that bloom is over with, they want them out of there as fast as you can move them. So suddenly you'll have uh, close to 2 million colonies on trucks heading out in various directions. Uh, they'll go back to um, Texas and, and, and Florida uh, for some, maybe some palmetto uh, uh, honey production or to, just to build up prior to them going up or for, for uh, packaged bee and queen production for those producers. Or they'll come up here into Oregon and, and Washington for uh, cherries, uh, apples, uh, 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 pollination. Do you want to tell what you put packaged bees are? I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. And then once uh, the um, uh, the almond or the uh, the the pollination from uh, cherries and, and apples are done in in this area, and when they're ready to move them up into uh, uh, honey production into the Montana and Dakotas, or up into New England for um, cranberry or apple uh, pollination. So these. Bees are literally on trucks throughout the year. Uh, they're almost, it, it's just amazing to see the operations. They literally drive them into long warehouses. They completely take these colonies apart in the, the fall, put them all back together again so that they're uniform, and they come out the other side of the, <coughs> of the warehouse and head off to California. And then they go on the circuit throughout the year and then back down to Florida where they're again split. Not all, and not everybody operates that, but some of the larger folks do. <coughs> the other important person in this whole background information is the um, uh, Dr. Doodle Little, who is pretty much credited, along with the fellow by the name of Miller, uh, with producing massive numbers of queens, uh, which is relatively important. And this is a picture of me uh, back in the uh, 70s, where we used to shake bees. I mean, you're literally shaking bees out of the colonies and move, pulling them into these large shaker boxes and, and funneling them into the funnels. And from there, we would um, send them off to Canada at the time. So what the practice used to be with, you know, up in Canada is that every year we would, they, the Canadians would cyanogas using cyanide to kill off their colonies. And they put everything into warehouses and um, uh, go on vacation. And then in January and February, we'd start to build the bees up in California, and in March and April, we'd shake them out, <coughs> we'd smoke them up, and then we'd, uh, later on in the season, we'd shake them out. And then we'd literally pack them in trucks, airplanes, uh, loaded DC nine, or DC-3s, with, uh, loaded with bees. And, you know, when you're loading that many bees in a small cockpit, it starts to get very, very warm in there. So it was a trick 
to get the bees on the plane and get the sober pilots in the plane at the right time and get them up into the air as quickly as possible. It, well, it happened once where we were loading and the, the pilot was so drunk that we had to unload the whole trip. <laughs> so that was the, the way things worked for a long time, both from California and from the southern states. Then something dramatic happened in 1987, and the border was closed, which caused great uh, consternation within the um, bee industry for a number of reasons. The primary cause of the, the closure, or the first cause of the closure, was a mite that is in the, the breathing or the tracheal tubes of the tracheal mite. Um, interestingly, as a side note, uh, we, we have been able to breed uh, less susceptibility to the tracheal mite uh, over time. It responded very well to selection, where now tracheal mite is virtually not a problem. Uh, and if it is a problem, if you requeen with a different stock, you're probably going like, to solve your problem. But that incident uh, back in the uh, 1920s uh, led to, uh, which was called the Isle of Wight disease, led to a law that banned any importation of any new bees into the United States. So it's not indigenous to in the United States. It had from 1600s until 1900s to bring in as much stock as we could, and most of them brought in their favorite stock from Germany or from Italy. So a relatively limited gene pool to begin with. And then to further exasperate that, in uh, 1956, I believe it was, um, Warwick Kerr uh, brought in the Africanized bees uh, into Brazil, and they reportedly were released accidentally. In fact, he probably reared a lot of queens off of those and it proliferated, but that resulted in a further extension of the law to limit the importation of semen into this country. And that held uh, in place until uh, about seven or eight years ago when WSU and UC Davis collaboratively got the first permit to bring semen in from various countries to try and increase the genetic diversity of, uh, of the gene pool um, here. And we were able to convince the USDA that Pullman was an island in a sea of wheat and therefore qualified <laughs> as a quarantine station. <laughs> and, and they bought it. So, well, modern queen production is really quite dramatic. And these are a few slides of how they rear these queens in these small little mating nuclei, we call them, and put them out in large fields. And these queens go out and mate. It's pretty dramatic to see and understand how queens mate. She will mate with up to 40 drones. And here again, showing the bees recognize the need for genetic diversity. And what they do is they go out in drone congregating areas. If you find a drone congregating area, it will always be in pretty much the same spot year after year. You walk in there and you throw a rock up and it's just bombarded with these comets of drones. And what happens is these are conical shaped uh, flight areas where massive drones are coming from all over the uh, area and the queens will come in and start out low and fly up through the center of the, this conical shape and will actually mate with up to 40 drones. So here again, the bees have built in genetic diversity into their whole reproductive system from uh, how the, the, the multimating to the drones coming from various sources around to avoid the potential for inbreeding. But what we developed here is that of all these queen producers, uh, and there are probably two or three hundred queen producers, but the number of using DNA analysis, they've been able to determine those million queens are coming from only 500, 350 to 500 queens. So very narrow. So you might buy a thousand queens from somebody and maybe he used just two breeder queens in order to produce that stock. So it, um, it, it, it is a serious issue that we have to face and it, what we firmly believe is that our long-term strategy for combating a lot of the problems we have is the selection process. And how do we go about doing the selection process in a way that will make a meaningful difference? But it's not as easy as you would suspect. 
This is the carniolan. It's a uh, uh, kind of a, a dark brown, black colored uh, bee. It does very well in cooler climates. Um, the Italian bee is uh, Lagustica. Uh, is a prolific. Uh, she just produces brood, brood and brood and brood to the point where they produce so many bees they'll starve to death because they will just keep laying. She'll keep laying eggs until. Uh, you know, there, there's a room, to, space to, to lay it. So with the carniolan, and this is the Caucasian, which is a very dark bee, which we just brought in a couple of years ago, will stop when the pollen or the nectar starts coming in. They're very sensitive to the environment as to how much they actually will produce, and they'll actually cluster down to a much tighter uh, cluster, and will actually uh, do much better uh, in cooler, damper climates. I pollinated for a cherry grower uh, once, and I brought him a load of our carnival and breeders just because I had nothing else to bring at the time. And from that point on, he would never let me bring in anything other than carnival because he swore they flew in the rain. And, that <laughs> and, and, and they do fly at, a, at lower temperature. So one of the things we would like to investigate, a matter of fact, we just got a grant, uh, WSU just got a grant, to look at these three species and look at their pollination uh, effectiveness in terms of, you know, so do you want a large colony that has lots of bees in it that won't, won't fly until it's 55 or 60, or do you go with a smaller colony, especially in the almonds where it's cooler, that will actually fly at a cooler temperature at say 45 to 50 degrees. So, um, but part of the problem with all of this breeding work is, did you have a question? No? Okay. Um, part of the problem with all this breeding work, and you know, I drive the geneticist crazy because I think color is an important characteristic to select for because of marketing. People like nice looking queens, nice uniform queens. I hate these yellow queens with a little black butt. They just are just ugly, but the nice <laughs> uniform colony is great. But other than color, what do you notice about that list? It's all the things that beekeepers want, not to mention uh, the, the resistance to uh, they're all behavioral. They're behavioral characteristics. They're more likely to go out and get pollen than honey, more industrious. Uh, their temperament, how aggressive they are. Uh, their hygienic behavior, how well they clean out diseased root. And then you understand what I just mentioned earlier, that one queen will go out and mate with up to 40 drones, and they'll store the, sper the sperm in a spermatheca that's her only mating flock. She goes out one time and stores up to five million sperm in the, her spermatheca. But how many subfamilies are there? What percentage of the bees are responsible for hygienic behavior? So you're trying to select off of these queens that are you know, diverse in, 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 in their very own, their nature. So it is not an easy thing to breed bees and to make meaningful selection. They will uh, respond very well to selection, but it's a difficult thing to do, and to get uniform results are, are very difficult. So that's background information. So what the heck is going on with colony collapse disorder? What is it? You know, viruses and pesticides and neonicotinoids. I'm going to talk about neonicotinoids a lot here in, in just a bit, uh, or, or various diseases or nutritional aspects. Well, a study that came out, uh, I think it was 2010, 2011 now, so it's a bit dated, but it still holds true. These guys found 61 variables associated with colony collapse disorder, or what they call colony collapse disorder, none of which are the definitive cause. So, what is it? And how real is it? Well, this is a survey done uh, by some uh, the Washington State beekeepers where they found about 39% loss, and this was in the 2009-2010 time frame. It's now uh, nationwide, they're estimating that it's around 30 to 35% that decline in bees. But you have to understand that the number of bees that you have is fluid throughout the year. You're constantly changing things. You're constantly uh, finding a queen that is crippled or or not performing as well, and you're tossing her out, and you might be combining two hives, and, 
and requeening with a new queen. So it's, it's a fluid number as you normally go through. But what they're counting is what they start out with and what they're able to finish the year off. And they tend to be losing more than <coughs> what we used to experience. Well, back in about 1987, uh, along with the tracheomite, shortly after the tracheomite, the varroa mite showed up. And the varroa mite is an is a external parasite. It would be equivalent to a basketball on me. Um, it's fairly large. You can see it. It's very clear. Um, and if you do not treat, if you do not use something to control the varroa mite, your colony will be dead in two years. They have, it has literally wiped out the feral population of honeybees. And an interesting dynamic is that we used to refer to Roa, Roa Jacobsoni, which is found on uh, Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, and it adapted very readily over to um, Apis mellifera. But now, Apis, the, the um, Varroa jacobsone has actually developed into a new haplotype that is uh, now the Varroa destructor, completely separate genus than the, uh, or completely separate species than the um, uh, Varroa jacobsone. And it's more virulent and uh, deadly than the uh, jacobsone. How did it get here? Well, back in 87, lots of beekeepers in Florida, specifically in Florida, were bragging about the fact that they couldn't get bees into the country, so they simply did pocket importation. Um, but it could have come in on a container vessel, or it could have come in uh, from a number of different uh, sources. Again, who cares? It's here, and we have to deal with it. And it's been extraordinarily frustrating for the bee industry. You know, I was, uh, at the time, uh, the Varroa Mite, I was a commercial beekeeper, a small commercial operation. And, but I was also vice president of the California State Beekeepers. And I got a call because I was on the task force that Varroa was in, found in the United States. Well, that very night, I went to uh, a load of, load of bees and was taking it down for melon pollination down in um, Fireball, California, in Central Valley. And as my typical, I would load the bees on at dusk and drive down and unload them in the middle of the night and then throw a sleeping bag on the back of the truck and get some sleep. Well, that particular night, I got drenched with boar's band by an aerial applicator. I mean, absolutely drenched. And I just said, you know, there's got to be a better way to make a living. But it amplifies that beekeepers hated the idea of pesticides, that we would have massive number of dead bees in front of our colonies routinely when we went into some of these pollination with chlorinated hydrocarbons, but mainly organophosphates and carbamates, whole colony wipes out, wipeouts. Well, for some reason, when I got out of beekeeping, I went back and got extra degrees. Not recommended, but. And when I came back into the, the industry, and I really wasn't ever out of it, because Sue was always into it, the number one control measure that beekeepers were using in order to combat the varroa mite was chemical. Um, the editor from Bleedings and Bee Culture, a popular magazine, Tim Clotum, told me, Tim, it happened in three issues of my magazine, <coughs> where pesticides, fluvalinate was the, the first chemical that was effective with it, uh, was brought out at the, some of the conventions and advertised heavily and literally everybody went to using fluvalinate. Well, um, that's expensive. And um, you know, get going through the labeling process, and fluvalinate is no longer effective on varroa mites. They completely develop resistance to it. But beekeepers are innovative and maverick, to say the least. So they would simply go and get a 55-gallon uh, drum of formic acid, start throwing tongue depressors in it, soaking it well, and then taking them out and putting it in the column. Formic acid has marginal effect. Well, then they found amitraz, tactic. It's used, anybody who runs cattle, it's used for tick 
control. It's a very good minus sum. But why pay the exorbitant price that for an individual strip of it um, when I can go out and buy a barrel of it and soak shop rags in it and, and, or grease patties? They're very innovative. They use the grease patties like Crisco and they'll put food coloring in it. So they'll put the amitraz in and then they'll put food coloring. So this year it's pink and then the next year it's green and the next year it's blue. And they scrape this stuff out. But they totally embrace chemical control as the only means of controlling the parole lines. We've lost a number of chemicals that no longer are effective. And Amitraz just got labeled this year, relabeled this year after beekeepers sued them uh, the first time and they pulled the label on it. Just got relabeled, but beekeepers have been using Amitraz for over 25 years. And Judy Wu, who is now at, uh, doing her doctoral work in University of Minnesota, was at Washington State University, and she looked at honeybee comb from uh, California and Washington beekeeping operations. The most common chemical that she found was levalinate, cumafos, which is also a, a product that the beekeepers are using, uh, cumafosoxin, which is a metabolite. This one is a, uh, is a, a lorstan. Um, which is what I got sprayed with. And then this is the metabolite of, um, of uh, Amitrex. Those are the com most common chemicals that she found within those operations. The USDA did a much broader uh, survey of comb, and you probably can't read it, but there's glutamate and cumafos at the top of their list. But they found over 121 pesticides in the wax uh, in honeybee colonies, in the wax, in the pollen, and the bees. Wax is very lipophilic, and it will sorb onto this material, and it will stay there for long periods of time. And now we do still have my friend, the aerial applicator, making applications in large areas, and that is also a problem, but the way that we used to do with the organophosphates and making the foliar spray out of the airplanes, it would primarily get the foragers, the worker bees out there. And they'd be coming back to the colonies, but they would be getting a lethal dose of the material and they'd soon die, and the bees would kick them out onto the front of the colony. You'd probably have piles of dead bees in the front of your, your operation. But the amount that was actually getting in and affecting the hive bees, the bee brood, and the queen was less. Not that it wasn't there, but it was less. But then along came the systemic pesticides that are on seed coated, seed treated, or using a drench method that drift down. And theoretically, you know, it's a problem because it's in both the xylem and the phloem of the plant. It's getting in the pollen, it's getting in the nectar. So the theory has it that you know, bees are picking it up bringing it back to the colony, and causing substantial problems. This little quote up here is also important in that there are synergistic effects that actually are occurring, that you have chemical A that may be innocuous to bees, and chemical B, which is relatively low toxicity, but when you have A and B together, including surfactants, which are sticker spreaders, that will actually enhance the toxicity to the bees where EPA has approved it, low toxicity to bees, but in combination it is very toxic to bees. But it's also very toxic at lower levels. So we used to always, are you familiar with LD50 or lethal dose milligram per kilogram that can kill 50% of the test animals? <clears throat> Dully up bees. What we're now seeing is sublethal effects where it doesn't outright kill the bees, but it has a negative impact. And this is very widespread. It's happening all over the Midwest. You know, back in um, the 80s when I was getting my undergraduate degree, you know, we were learning about this new concept of integrated pest management. Why would you have to use integrated pest management when you can just treat everything and not worry about it? So we've gone, the agricultural community has now gone to prophylactic treatment for any pest. And it's cheap, it's easy, it's almost hard to find seed that's not treated. It's so common and ubiquitous. 
And it's not, you know, so the neonicotinoids are really uh, taking a hit. And by no means are neonicotinoids good for bees. And it's logical that the beekeepers are associated with neonicotinoids as causing a lot of their problem. Because the neonicotinoids were introduced around 1994, 95, and they have increased dramatically over the last few years. That's the black dots. The white dots are the um, uh, decline of honeybees. And so it makes sense. But, you know, correlation, not causation. Um, and then we look at neonicotinoids and we look at some of the other chemicals that I mentioned earlier, the organophosphates, the carbamates, the chlorinated hydrocarbons. Neonicotinoids have a relatively low mammalian toxicity. They're relatively safe for people to be able to use. They are fairly effective. But there are over 465 products currently um, allowed uses in the state of Washington alone. If you go into your store, you're going to find, it won't say neonicotinoids, but it's going to say something like the metacorporate. Um, but, and, and a lot of the concern, over 150 are for, uh, allowed for home use. And the difference being, from the earlier chart I showed, is that it not only affects the foragers, but they bring it back into the colony, and they are now affecting the brood, they're affecting the uh, queens, they are affecting... The, uh, the, the hive bees. And it's clear in laboratory settings that it has effects like altered learning behavior. They're no longer able to go out and forage and return to the colony as effectively. They may not remember where the, 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 the nectar source is. Um, the, the having uh, various sublethal impacts on the bees that reduce their overall fitness. There's also a side note a little bit that when the bees bring back pollen, you see the pollen baskets on the curriculum, they knock that off and they drop it into uh, the cell and then they kind of pack it in and they add enzymes and there's some microbial activity that goes on and that actually breaks down the nutrients and makes the nutrients available in the pollen grain. When you go to the health food store and you buy all those pollen grains, those are actually knocked off of the curricula of the bees as they go into the colony. And you eat that, that's just going to pass right through you. If the bees were to try and consume that, it would just pass right through them. I don't know of only one insect that can pierce a pollen grain, and that is the, uh, the thrips will actually pierce the, uh, uh, the pollen grain. So, they, it, it, what they're speculating also is that the large amount of fungicides that are used uh, is actually having an effect on the microbial activity in the bee bread. So it is affecting the nutritional aspect of uh, the, the pollen. But getting back to, to neonicotinoids, um, we have yet to find field level neonicotinoids that match the or, or mimic the um, levels that they've been able to show harm to bees in the laboratory. Generally it's from 50 parts per million down to as little as 20 parts per billion. And yet we're having trouble finding it in the field at, except in some isolated incidents like when they're actually uh, planting the seeds and the dust is coming up behind the, the, the planters where it's relatively high levels of, 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 of the neonicotinoids. We're not finding it in that high levels in field situations. The USDA's uh, uh, chart that I showed earlier uh, out of the 121, they did the first uh, uh, in, Neonicotinoid they found was 40th on that list, and that's in prevalent. Prevalent. Oh, how commonly they found it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were somewhat interested in this uh, idea, and so over the last year, we just completed this study. Uh, we went to 148 apiaries around the state of Washington. I personally went and 
uh, to 130 of those. Uh, all around the Puget Sound region, except for uh, Mason and um, uh, Kitsap County, because I couldn't find a beekeeper uh, willing to let me go in their colonies, all these were cooperating beekeepers. Uh, so down in Clark County in some agricultural areas, and now here in Spokane, and um, I'm not sure which county that is, but it's, uh, it's north of Yakima. Is that Clark County? No, not, not Clark County. Yet. Grant? Grant? Maybe. Um, and what we do when we go, went out there is we actually find the bee bread, that stuff, the pollen that they've ticked off in the cells, and I drilled a two-inch hole uh, right through the midrib to collect the a sample, and then we wrap that up and uh, collect a, a wax sample and some bee samples, and we send them down to the um, uh, environmental toxicology lab at WSU in, in Pasco. We still haven't completed all of the samples yet because the machine has broke down, and has, but we've gone through about 90% of them, and so far we have found no detectable levels of neonicotinoids at the five parts per billion level. That does not mean they're not out there. It simply means we didn't find them. But if they were as big of a problem as everyone <coughs> suspected that they are, um, I would have at least, it would have made a much nicer story, for one thing. But um, <laughs> it would have, um, uh, we, we should have found something. So this is really good news for the beekeeper, that we don't have a level of neonicotinoids throughout the state that some people may have suspected. And there's a, you, you see various things, this was on October 4th, uh, last year where uh, a researcher came out with a publication saying it's pollution, it's air pollution that's calling, call, causing the colony collapse disorder. The very next day, well that was October 3rd, it's October 4th, no it's not air pollution, it's selenium that's causing uh, colony collapse disorder. It's almost becoming the disease or the problem of the day and cell phones or whatever is causing the problem. And a lot of folks pointing the finger at neonicotinoids, but without, I think, sufficient evidence to do that. I don't think neonicotinoids are good for bees. But are they the problem with colony collapse disorder? I don't see the evidence to suggest <coughs> that it is. There are a lot of other problems that are out there. There are pathogens out there that have been shown that when bees are exposed to neonicotinoids, they may be more susceptible to uh, things like microsporidians, the, the Nocema serrani or Nocema apis. Um, and there's a whole uh, host of viruses that are out there. And this list has now grown to around 25 or so uh, viruses that I think goes back again to the varroa mite. The rural mite is piercing the skeletal structure of the exoskeletal structure of the, the bee and introducing pathogens directly in. We used to see occasionally black queen virus, and now it's causing large scale uh, loss of queens and, and that are being produced. And we have these huge monocultures and very efficient agricultural systems like almonds, like you see in the fields around here, where they don't want anything other than the crop that they need. It's very pristine. In California, because of the E. coli scare, you have bare soil right down to repair, right down to the water's edge in a lot of areas, because they don't want any wildlife in there. So we have totally eliminated the source of nectar and pollen for bees that other than the, the, the main crop. Fortunately for a lot of us who have been talking about this for a long time, there's a paper that was just published in, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Environmental Toxicology, or, uh, that showed that, no it wasn't, it, it was, uh, I, I forget the name of the paper, or the name of the journal now, but that bees will actually be more stimulated with a diversity
diversity of flowers in the area and you'll get more bees on the target plant when you have a diversity of flowers in the region. So all these cherry growers that go out and cut all of their dandelions so that the bees are only on the cherries are actually hurting themselves. You can actually increase, because the bees don't care about the cherry. They don't care about the pollen. Bees' only source of protein is pollen. And when they need the pollen, uh, the protein to feed to the young, you provide nectar and pollen, it stimulates the queen to lay more eggs. When they lay more eggs, there's more demand for royal jelly. They get the royal jelly from pollen and the nectar. So they're out there getting more of it. It's all about bees, is the stimulus. You stimulate them, and they'll respond. And so the more we stimulate them, the better they're going to do. But I don't want to just harp on agriculture and monoculture, because this is a beekeeping operation, and I've been doing this for a long time. This was in January of 2013. I couldn't take, I didn't have my new iPhone yet, so I couldn't patch all these together. <laughs> That is 84,000 honeybee colonies, not 84,000 bees, 84,000 honeybee colonies, all in the same spot. And there's not a flower in sight. Those bees are there from September until February when they go into pollination. Now, there's a researcher out of the University of Illinois, May Baerbaum, who came out with a paper last year, and she actually was interviewed on NPR. And what she showed that there is a gene that bees that helps bees detoxify natural occurring toxins. If you feed them only sugar, that gene does not upregulate, so it doesn't turn off. Now, if you told Brett Eighty that you're about ready to go into an agricultural setting with lots of toxins being out there, and there's a gene that will help the bees detoxify some of those toxins, but it's not going to turn on if you feed them sugar syrup and supplemental feed for, uh, as a, do you think he might change his business practices? Well, maybe not bread, but most people might. <laughs> and, you know, so where it really comes down to, I'm afraid, is that we have a new normal, and that we live in a very toxic world. And it's a lot of things that are causing bees problems. It's beekeeper applied pesticides, it's agricultural pesticides, it's the environment that we live in. And it's also affecting the native pollinators. And if native pollinators even benefit, are, are even higher uh, numbers in, that, in the paper that I was mentioning, uh, when you have flowers for, uh, in the close proximity to the target crop, blueberries was the one they were using. They found more bumblebees, more uh, uh, leafcutter bees, more uh, the, the uh, Mason bees on those plants when those oh, bumblebees and surfeit flies, excuse me, what the paper actually looked at, on bumble on blueberries when they had flowers in close proximity other than the target population. As the control was a grass setting. So this is having implications for native bees as well. So we need to do a lot more in terms of getting, bees, getting farmers to understand the implications and the importance of bees and their survivability more so than just during the, uh, the particular bloom that they're interested in having them there. And I think that that is start, message is starting to sink in. And we need to do more in terms of our breeding work. Richard Dawkins in his book on evolution a couple of years ago specifically stated that if you are dependent on honeybees for pollination and you are not selecting for increased uh, attractiveness in your crop, be it onion or carrot or alfalfa or whatever, you're totally missing the boat. So we need to look at how do we increase the rewards and the benefits to bees besides just what is on the uh, uh, target, uh, uh, target uh, crop that we're interested in. So what do we do? Quoting a beekeeper friend of mine, I can't make money off of dead bees. So they're under pressure to use chemicals all the time to keep the bees alive. Because remember, if you don't treat for varroa, they will be dead in two years. 
So there's that heavy pressure on the beekeeper to keep those bees healthy and to dump large amounts of chemicals on the bees. When they lose, as one said uh, at a meeting a couple years ago, what happens when all the stuff that we're using illegally doesn't work anymore? Because there isn't anything in the, in the pipeline. What we need to do is look at long-term solution. We need to do more work with genetic diversity. We need to do more work with, with breeding. And we really need to stop the last line, which most people pick up on. We need to increase education. But we need to stop pandering to the industry as well, both the agricultural industry and the beekeeping industry, and stating it straight in terms of what are you doing to your colonies and the bees. And this is where I'm... I, I serve on, as by state law, all county directors serve on the noxious weed control boards for county. So I'm on the Island County Noxious Weed Control Board. And that noxious weed control board has just put out this pretty little fire about protect the bees. Well, that's nice. But when you go out and you spray a broadleaf herbicide over vast areas in hopes of killing all the scotch broom, does anybody think we're going to eradicate this country? <laughs> <laughs> but it is wiping out all of the dicots, all of the flowering plants, and then coming back and seeding it with grass seed. Now, the argument that many noxious weed people say, well, we have to control these noxious weeds because they're crowding out the natives. And this stuff isn't? <clears throat> and we aren't going back and replanting. What we really need to do, if we're really going to solve, and again, quoting me, Baerbaum, if you want to solve the bee problems, plant more flowers. And as silly as that sounds, it is true. And the Noxious Weed Control Board is responding to that. And they give little seed packs they give out to everybody to, to plant in their backyard. Well, come on! <laughs> if we're really going to be serious about this, we're going to invest in how we can grow large amounts of eco-appropriate and native seed so that we can reseed large areas of habitat and increasing large areas of habitat. Road root beautification, enhancement to farmers to, to not only you just take areas out of production but to plant it in pollinator friendly plants along roadsides. Uh, within areas and forested areas. Once you, if you have to go in and spray to control a noxious weed, they ought to be required to be going back and putting in flowering plants that are native to that region, or at least eco-appropriate for that region. And it, we need to be doing it on a much larger scale than we currently are. I don't want to demean, you know, habitat, you know, urban habitat and getting people to, to plant more flowers. I think it's a very, very important thing to do from an awareness perspective, and it's certainly going to help the bees. We are in the process of, we have uh, five acres, uh, and I keep telling my neighbors it's a managed wheat patch, you know, so we, we have a lot of different flowers blooming out there, and, and we let them go the whole stage because we're, we're reseeding. So I think we need to do more of that, and we need to m increase the overall understanding of how we go about doing this in an effective manner. Uh, the abundance, 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 there has to be a lot of flowers. I mean, somebody's figured out how many flowers a bee has to visit in order to make a pound of honey, but it's a lot. Um, they have to bloom sequentially throughout the year. It can't just be for short periods of time. There needs to be a diversity. Bees do better. Not only honey bees, but native bees do better on a diversity of floral mixes. And we need to mitigate and use pesticides judiciously. If you want to know more about which type of plants to plant, go to pollinator.org, you type in your zip code, and it will give you that information. And of course, there is an app for it that you can download for free. And then uh, there's also uh, a fact sheet that uh, I wrote that kind of summarizes everything that I just talked about. Don't worry about writing this down, just Google honeybees, neonicotinoids, WSU, and you'll get it. Uh, and we have a, a, a matrix of the recent publications on neonicotinoids, and but I talk in, in this about all of the things, the beekeepers, uh, what they're doing, and that impact, loss of habitat, are all various factors. 
So with that, I will certainly open up. <laughs>